Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, a couple weeks ago, we started Ask the Pastor, and I want to address one of the questions that was given to me. Uh, the question is, Hebrews 4.12 uh, talks of dividing soul and spirit. Can you define the differences between soul and spirit? Yes, I can. <laughs> I love the easy ones. <laughs> Out loud? Oh, you mean elucidate. Okay. The soul is often des described as the mind, will, and emotions. The soul is what defines you as who you are. Okay? So how you think, how you feel, how you act. The soul is the person that you are. Okay? The spirit... Scripture teaches us that those that do not know God are dead in the spirit, or, or better yet, are not alive in the spirit. They have not been born of the spirit. Um, to the believer, this is the part of you that connects with God. Okay? It's the, spark, the, the part of you that God births, it's the, the new you that God births in you that is able to have connection with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so simply put, in the, the simplest manner possible, the soul is who you are, the spirit is what God births in you to have connection with him. Got it? Okay, if you want more information about it than that, talk to me after church, I'll give you a number of books. Okay, so no, they did. this was anonymous, so if this was your question, I'm going to leave it right up here, feel free to come and get it. Um, or not. Moment of panic because I thought I misplaced my notes. We are starting a new series today. Aren't you excited? Yes. yes. Wait till I tell you what the series is. <clears throat> you guys pay attention to the news in some measure. And we see persecution against the church um, all over the globe. Um, the U.S., we're not persecuted, guys. We're not. Okay? I think we're moving that direction, and I think we're moving that direction much more quickly than we expect. But right now, we're, we're not suffering persecution. Okay? Um, but we are in a war to the death. And we as Christians have to understand that this is no quarter given, no quarter asked. That means that it, it is to the line, to the death. Now, that's heavy duty stuff and you need to be aware of that. The good news is, if you're a Christian, it's not to your death. Okay? Because um, we may exit this life, but we are actually receiving our reward. So, so if you consider that a bad thing, I don't think you understand what God has done. Okay? When you get to the end of your life and you cross that boundary into what God has for you in eternity, that's a graduation. That's not an end. That's a promotion. Okay? But in this life... We are engaged in a battle all the time, 24-7. There is no respite in this war. Now, I don't know any of you guys. Uh, I know James has studied some history. Um, I actually have read quite a few books on tactics and strategy. Um, there are three maxims of war that every great tactician has established, okay? And we're gonna work through a, a little bit of that today, but our series is gonna be about spiritual warfare, okay? So I'm asking you right at the front, pray for me and my family, okay? Because as we start exposing things that are going on, the enemy is gonna be coming against us. And I'm gonna pray for you, because as you start hearing what's really going on underneath the covers, the enemy's gonna come against you, all right? When, when you're sitting all comfortable and placid and complacent, you're not a threat to the enemy. He doesn't care. 
And if you're not getting rocked in some way, look around. Because chances are you're not a threat to anyone. Okay? So pray for me and my family. We're going to be praying for you guys. The three maxims of war that every good leader has to know. Know yourself. Okay? Know yourself. Know what you are capable of doing and what you're not capable of doing. Know your enemy. Know what your enemy is capable of doing and what he is not capable of doing. Know the battleground. Know the area in which the fight takes place. Okay? So we're going to work through these three points today just to kind of introduce this subject. And we're going to start with know yourself. No, nope, we're not. Just kidding. We're going to start with know your enemy. Then we'll move to know yourself. Because, see, we have this idea that the enemy out there is people. People that disagree with us. People that have different ideas. ISIS, Boko Haram, those are the enemy. No. No, those are just tools that the enemy uses. Okay? Those are people that Christ died for, that God longs to save. They are deceived, they are misled. <clears throat> and, and honestly, if they are not saved, there is great wrath stored up for them. Okay? So when we look on them, we really need to be pitying them. Because, yeah, it might look like they have victory in this life. Okay, so they killed 23 Christians. They killed 23 Christians. That offends our sense of morality. Our sense of fair play is offended because they took them captive and then slaughtered them while they were bound. But, but really, is that a loss to Christians? Ah. Uh. Do you, do you think those 23 right now are regretting that? No, they're standing in the presence of God. Their blood is calling out to Him. They have received their reward. They've got something we don't even comprehend right now. I spoke last week, I just touched on for just, just a minute, about the revival that is going on in the Islamic world. We're not seeing this in the news. But you start looking at some of the people that are actually working in the field over in Iraq, in Syria, in Africa, Iran. Iran has a revival going on that puts anything happening in America to shame. Because people are coming to the Lord left and right. Because they see that Allah does not have what they need. And we're not just talking moderate or, or, or just kind of lackadaisical Muslims. We're talking radical Muslims who have slaughtered people in the name of Allah. And they go, it's left me empty. I've given everything for him and I'm empty. There's got to be more. So if, if ISIS is not our enemy, if Boko Haram is not our enemy, if... if whatever you happen to have in your head is not your enemy, then who's the enemy? What's that? Satan. Yup. So who is Satan? What do we know about him? Okay. We, we know quite a bit about him, don't we? Well, first, where did he come from? There are a couple passages. You can look these up at your leisure, but I'm, I'm just going to read a couple snippets, okay? Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, some people look at this and they go, hey, this is not talking about the devil. I mean, it's addressed to the king of Tyre. But we believe that is, this is dualistic in nature because the description that he gives, while in some measure fits the king of Tyre at this time, it really doesn't. So we believe this is a prophetic utterance that is showing the Jews first and then us the nature of the enemy, where he came from. I'm just going to read a little bit out of uh, Ezekiel 28. Um, this is verse 12, starting in verse 12. 
says, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. Okay, so obviously this is not really being addressed to the king of Tyre because he never made it to the Garden of Eden. That was sealed up long before he was born. So there's a dualistic thing going on here. There is something beyond just a message to the king of Tyre. Because man, the king of Tyre is hearing this. He's <laughs> oh yeah, that's me. Yeah, what, what did it say I was? My... Gold is my setting, and precious jewels my covering. Somebody call my tailor. Okay? It's not talking about the king of Tyre. Okay? Now, um, we believe this is one of two passages in the Old Testament that describe Lucifer before he fell. All right? Um... Isaiah chapter 14 is the other one. I'm just going to read a little snippet of this. Um, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who lay the nations low. Uh, again, this is another passage. This one is addressed to the king of Babylon. But again, it's dualistic in nature. This passage is where we get the name Lucifer. Lucifer translated is the morning star or the son of dawn. All right, so some of your translations will have it one way, some will have it another. Some of the older translations actually use the name Lucifer here. Okay, That's what we believe he was called before he fell. But, you, but did you notice he fell? All right, He did not retain his place in the heavens. He lost it. It was taken away. <clears throat> um... So Ezekiel chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 14, those are two passages you really want to be familiar with and understanding where the enemy came from and how he got where he is. All right? He fell in pride and he was cast down to, uh, from heaven to earth. First Timothy tells us, um, in, in speaking about elders, it says, he must not be a recent convert or he may, became, he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Okay? It goes on to say, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. See, this, this is setting up a warning to leaders in the church. Look, you are being put into a position of authority and responsibility, but ultimately you are accountable before God to this position. Don't let it puff your head up, because that's how the enemy fell. Okay? Now, of the angels that we have in Scripture, there are only three that are given any kind of name, and so we place uh, a special significance on them. You guys know what the other two are besides Lucifer? Michael. Michael, Michael and Gabriel. And they're often referred to as the archangels, okay? The ones that are over. Now, nothing in Scripture says Gabriel is an archangel. He says by himself that he is the messenger of God, but he's the only one besides Michael and Lucifer that was given a name. So obviously he's of some importance, all right? So Lucifer, who was on the very mountain of God, puffed himself up and said, I will ascend to the heights of heaven, to the very throne of God itself. Now what's interesting about this is, go back to Genesis chapter 3, and we see the same thing playing out in the garden. Adam and Eve are going about their work, and the serpent comes in, and he walks in. That must have been weird. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it wouldn't have been weird for them because that's the only way they knew him, but boy, that's weird for us. And then the, the, the serpent spoke, which is even more weird, but again, it wasn't weird to them because she responded. It wasn't like a big deal. And what was it that the serpent was trying to convince her? Hey, what, what about this fruit here? Oh, no, no, no. God said not to even touch it. Is that what God said? No, what did God say? Don't eat it. He didn't say don't touch it. So already we see the effect of Jewishness at work. <laughs> if this is dangerous, we're going to forbid this. That way we never approach that. Okay? And so he says, well, 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 surely God didn't say that because he knows that if you eat of this, you will become like him. Knowing good and evil. Now, to me, that's, that is no temptation at all. <laughs> knowing good and evil, I don't want to know it. I already know more than I want to know now. Man, evil is disgusting. Some of the things that are done in the world today, there is no other word to describe it but evil. Okay? But the, the whole thrust is that you will be like God. Take yourself out of your position and promote yourself to a position that was not intended for you. See the same thing here? Pride. It's pride. Lucifer exalted himself in pride and God said, yeah, you know what? You're out. Boop. And out he went. And he comes to earth and he looks at all the things on earth and he sees this prized creation that God has done. That in the cool of the evening, God comes down and walks with Adam and Eve in the garden. And he says, oh, I'm going to ruin that. And he did. Man exalted himself, and God humbled him. And he brought death into the world. All right? So we see that he started off as an angel. He puffed himself up in pride. He is the one that came in and deceived Eve. And man brought sin into the world. Uh, he is also called the ruler of this world. Now this is kind of an interesting thing because scripture very clearly says he's the ruler of this world but he's still subject to God who is the ultimate sovereign over everything and the world in that context I don't believe means this physical earth. I think it means the system by which this earth is governed. Okay, And the reason that he's the ruler over it is because right now there's sin throughout this world. Okay, No one is born into this world without sin. Therefore, when they come into this world, they are sinful. Therefore, he is their boss. All right. Now, the thing about this that is really amazing to me is there are foolish people out there that really earnestly and honestly believe that the devil's their buddy. They, they worship him. They worship him. And ultimately, at the head of every false religion is the devil. And there are people that are bowing down and worshiping him and doing things in his name. And what he wants for them is death. And I don't mean just to kill them, this body, but to have them in eternity suffer his fate. To separate them from God for all of eternity. That is his ultimate goal for every single person on this planet. Now you see why it's so important that we carry the word of hope, the gospel, into that dark place. Because that's where they're going. An eternity separated from God. Cast into the lake of fire. The outer darkness. Okay? So... He is called the ruler of this world. Uh, John 12, 31 and 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Just make note of those. You can check those out later. He is also called the prince of the air in Ephesians 2, 2. It says that before we were saved, we were followers of the prince of the power of the air. And this is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Okay? See, see, see what's going on here? There's two things. One, it calls him the prince of the power of the air. Two, he is the power that's at work in the sons of disobedience. 
See, he, he's active. He's not sitting on some weird throne with a pitchfork and a little red suit enjoying a brisk flame. He's active. He is doing everything he can to undo the work of God. And he's doing everything in his power, which, by the way, is significantly greater than ours as humans. He's doing everything in his power to drag as many people into an eternity of hell <coughs> as he can. Okay? So, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Alright? So, you, you kind of get the picture. This guy is not really a nice guy. Um, his name... Satan means adversary. All right? He's also called the devil. You know what devil means? Slanderer. Slanderer. So, uh, the book of Job gives us kind of a unique insight into how this whole dynamic works. God is sitting on his throne. The angels are coming and presenting before him. And in walks Satan. What does he do? Come to have tea? No. What's he doing? Yeah, he's coming in to talk smack. All right, he's already booted you out of heaven. You're coming in. Hey, Satan, what are you doing? Oh, you know, just going to and fro throughout the earth, checking it out, you know, not much. And God says, hey, hey. You checked out my servant, Job? I like that guy. Well, yeah! Of course you like him. You've got him protected. I can't even touch him. You've given him all kinds of blessings. What's he doing? He's starting to slander. But if he had all of those taken away, he would curse you. Go ahead. Up to him himself, everything is yours. Do what you will. So he comes down, and Job loses everything. Children, camels, goats, property, it's gone. Gone. We know that his wife was left to him, and I'm not sure he wasn't kind of regretting that she didn't go too. <laughs> and we know that there were three servants left to him. Because those were the three ones that came to him and said, everything's gone. So, flashback to heaven again. God's sitting on his throne. The angels are presenting themselves to him. Satan comes in. Hey, Satan, where you been? Oh, you know, roaming to and fro about the earth. Remember what you told me about Job? Huh? Yeah. Check that action out. He's still not sinning. Well, yeah, of course not. You wouldn't let me touch him. Yeah, yeah, I got to take away all the stuff, but I tell you what, you let me afflict him and he's going to curse you. He's slandering again. He's slandering. God says, up unto his life. You cannot take his life, but up to that. And so Satan goes down and, boing. Painful boils. Now, I, I've never had a boil. I hope I never do. But from head to toe, he was covered in these things. And I don't know what that is, but to take a piece of broken pottery and scrape them, that just does not sound cool to me. <laughs> this does not sound like something I would want. And yet even in this, Job did not accuse God. So then we see the whole book, and actually, I'm, I'm, before I started this series, this was one of the series... I thought about doing We're probably going to move into the book of Job before too long because the interplay that goes on between him and his three friends is incredible. And their holy counsel, their godly counsel, which sounds so righteous as they speak to Job, is really just hot air. It's really pride speaking forth. And then Job, now this is the one thing I don't understand about Job except that I do it. 
No problem. You should have put them on speakerphone. <laughs> Job says, I want to talk to God. I want to present my case because I know if I do, He's going to see my value. He's going to see my righteousness. And God says, all right, speak up, worm. <laughs> what do you got to say? I, 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 I. <laughs> Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I separated the sea from the land? And I said, you can come this far and no further. Where were you when I created everything? Where were you? I got nothing. I got nothing. But it doesn't end there, does it? Because after God displays his sovereign power, his very nature... He tells Job something very interesting. He says, pray for these men. Pray for them. And then God restores to him not just what he had, but more. Okay? So, what happened to Satan there? He came in, he tried to slander, he tried to slander. God gave him boundaries in which he could operate. And it still did not work. Now, not only is he a slanderer, he is also an accuser. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12 says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. He is the one who is standing before God as the prosecuting attorney and trying with everything in him to condemn you. He wants the judge to set you off away from himself. And he's vicious. As a prosecuting attorney, he is vicious because he's got a lot to play with because we give him a lot of ammunition that would allow a just judge to justifiably kick us out. <coughs> Thankfully, we have a defender who intercedes on our behalf before the judge. But the only thing that could ever work, they're covered in my blood. This one's mine. I paid the price for this one. But you think that stops the devil? Absolutely not. Why? Because we keep goofing up. Oh, did you see what he just thought? Ooh. Wow, you really want to spend eternity with that? Did you see who he rooted for in the last Super Bowl? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <clears throat> did you hear what she just said? Yeah, yeah, Dad, she's mine. <clears throat> that, that sin's paid for. Day and night, he accuses you. He never stops, which is why Jesus never stops interceding. Okay? Man, if that is not something to worship God for, to praise God for, to get you excited about, then man, you're already dead. So he is an accuser, a slanderer, and an accuser. As a matter of fact, Paul writing in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3, he says, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. So he's not only an accuser, he's a... Tempter. And you know, he doesn't have to do a heck of a lot to tempt us. Okay? We, we are very easily distracted. Okay? And I, I, I'm going to use myself as an example. All right? I get focused on things. Man, Christy would be like, sweetie, what did you want to do about this? 
Oh, do about what? We, you said you were going to tell me what, what, you know, what verse did you want on the front of the bulletin? Yes. <laughs> Sweetie, what? What verse do you want on the front of the bulletin? Um, what'd you say? <laughs> so what, what verse do you want on the front of the bulletin? Oh, for, for Sunday? Yeah, that bulletin, yes. Can I get back with you on that? Soon? I, I get very focused. And if my focus is not on God, it is very easy for the enemy to get me. And, and I'll tell you what, it's getting worse. I am fully convinced that the enemy knows that his time is drawing near and he has pulled out all stops. He is flooding the earth with every perverse temptation that there is. And he's going to make it harder and harder and harder on you. Now, is that ever going to separate you from the love of God? Absolutely not. But it's going to keep you from living victoriously in this life. It's going to keep you bound up and not doing the things that God really intends for you to do. He's going to make you ineffective as a warrior in this fight. Guys, battle coming up, battle coming up, battle coming up. Man, we got to get prepared to fight the fight. Amen. we got to get prepared to fight the fight. Hey, did you hear about that game? I cannot believe that wreck. Did you see that call? That that I cannot believe. Hey, what about, did you hear what Obama said? Well, did he really say that or is that what they said he said? I don't know, but, but it was bad. <laughs> did you see what was on the news? Did you see what that guy did to those children? <clears throat> hey, did you try this incredible dessert? I saw it on Pinterest. It looks wonderful. That doesn't look anything like the picture. <laughs> At all. <laughs> we have so short of an attention span. God has called us to be disciples. The same root as discipline. Okay? Why do you think that was? Because he wanted us to just float along in life? No. Do you understand that God expects that you will exert some discipline in your life. Right? He's going to require some things of you. For example... Disciplining your mind to think what is right. Not allowing those thoughts to come into your head. God is good. God is great. Wow, did you see that woman? No, no, no. God is good. God is great. I cannot believe what he did. No, I'm not even going there. God is good. God is great. Man, when I was 12 years old, that dude did me dirt. I'm not going to think on those things. I'm going to choose what I think about, what I dwell. And the devil's going to keep throwing them at you. He's going to put them right there in front of your feet. They're going to, oh, look at that. Let me pick that up and look on that. All right? He's a tempter because he wants to keep you out of the fight. He wants to keep you bound up and not living victoriously. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. God's idea of living victoriously is very different than we're seeing on television and in a lot of the books out there today that are just crap. All right? I'm sorry, but that's what it is. God wants you holy. And if your happiness is contingent on having a bigger car, a bigger house, a bigger checkbook, then you have completely missed all that God has done for you. Okay? Okay? You've completely missed that. And if you're sitting here in expectation saying, God, give me, 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 give me. Then you've misunderstood what going to the cross is all about. Because see, when you come to Christ, you come to die. That you might have new life. That your minds might be regenerated. They might be renewed. So you will understand what God's will is. You don't think that's part of the devil's plan? Is to sow that kind of garbage into church theology and doctrine? 
where we spend the entirety of our lives chasing after things? Okay, so when you die, you have the biggest Winnebago on the block. And guess what? You can't take it with you. And probably the kid you don't like is the one that's going to get it. <laughs> Why? Because none of the other kids like him either. And they just want to shut him up. You, guys, you get the Winnebago, man. Take it. Take it and go drive far away from Alaska. I heard the Winnebago is really good in Alaska. Okay? The tempter, he's also a deceiver. The whole story of Genesis chapter 3. Second Corinthians says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay? So, he's blinding them. He's deceiving them. Revelation 20, verse 3. They threw him into the pit and shut it up and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. Okay? He is not alone. You understand that it's not just the devil we're contending with. That he has a vast army. Okay? You want to know how big... The demonic host is, after you've counted up all the stars in the heaven, divide it by three. One third of those is approximately the number of the demonic host that he has. That's a little overwhelming. Until you understand one of two things. First, the other two thirds belong to God. And second, and even more importantly, the one that is living inside of us is greater than him and anything he can throw at us. Amen. See, God doesn't need the angelic host to defeat Satan and all of his minions. All he's got to do is speak the word. That's it. God has set the boundaries for him and said, you can go this far and no further. And sometimes he'll let them come a little bit further in your life. Why? To make you feel cruddy about yourself? No. To grow you. To strengthen you. To build you up. Boy, that was a tough one. And on the other side, you're stronger than you were when you started. Okay? That's always God's purpose and plan. The enemy just steamrolled me. You betcha. Probably not going to do it again the next time. Guess what? He steamrolled me again. Evidently, he didn't learn the first time. <laughs> you know what? I take back what I said. Until you learn it. You're going to keep getting steamrolled. I'm, I'm that. Man, there are certain areas in my life that the enemy can just go... Yeah. Just like that. And I, I pray every day, God, please, keep the steamroller out of my life. <laughs> and what I need to be praying is, God, help me to get past this, to grow in this, that the steamroller would no longer be effective. <clears throat> so he has a vast army working for him. Ephesians chapter 6, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over, the <clears throat> over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You, you get that? There are ranks upon ranks upon ranks of demonic hosts out there. And they are greater than you. But not greater than the one that lives in you. See, Scripture tells us that God has made us a little lower than the angels. They can do stuff that we, we don't even comprehend. Okay? They, they're, they're just, I mean, quite honestly, you, you think you got them figured out? Try to get to heaven like they do. Go back and forth like they do. Okay? See, they're, they're greater than we are. All right? But what God has birthed in us, what God has sealed in us, what God has placed living inside of us is greater in every way than they are. Every way. Okay? So, 
He has a lot of minions. He is far beyond our understanding. Now this is important, people, because there's a lot of people out there that do really weird things concerning the devil. I mean, it's like they lace up the gloves and man, they're going to duke it out with the devil. That's stupid. Okay? You understand that's not what God has called us to do. Right? Why? Because that's his job. Our job is to stand firm. We resist him, but man, up, man people say all kinds of foolish things. <coughs> they call him names. I, I grew up in a household where, man, people would call the devil all kinds of names. You, know, you, you think that really bugs him? Really? Whose eyes are you focusing? Where, where are your eyes focused right there? What are you looking at? Are you looking at God or are you looking at the devil? Who are you celebrating right there? Jude makes this very clear. <clears throat> Jude, uh, verses 9 and 10, says, But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but he said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they are. Like unreasoning animals, they understand instinctively. See, look, I don't know why God created things the way that he did. And the cool thing about it is I don't need to know. But I know that the order of being superiority, the devil and his demons are greater than me, physically. I, I, I don't have anything to contend with them. I mean, these guys that were possessed, they snap chains. Nobody could restrain them. Okay? Um, just so you are aware, those are not fanciful tales. That stuff is still going on today. Often today. Often. And if it were up to us and our power, we would lose. But it's not our power. See, we're sealed. We're marked with the blood of Christ. We are the very children of God. And it's his spirit that contends with the enemy. Not ours. So he's beyond our understanding. But now we come to kind of the good stuff. <coughs> All right? He was defeated at Calvary. Colossians 2.15 says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. You get that? Satan is already defeated in eternity and he knows it. He knows it. You need to know that. You need to understand that you are fighting a defeated foe. Yeah, he's still got a lot of power. Um, <clears throat> Travis, I'm going <clears> to <throat> share one of your stories. Uh, I, I don't know anything about snakes other than I don't like them. And I don't want to be around them. I don't even want to watch them on TV. All right? One of the traits that every band note male has that I know of is we do not like snakes. And yeah, we're afraid of them. We were at a, a church picnic one time, and a couple kids knew I didn't like snakes, and they found this, I don't know what, it was a snake, and it was green. And it was about this long, and its head was this. <laughs> and I know it was like this because they walked up and they said, Hey, Glenn, look! And it, it was huge. Okay? I don't like snakes. But Travis was telling me <clears throat> that you can shoot a rattlesnake and it will still strike at you, even though it's dead. Now, I, that, to, that's horrifying to me. <laughs> I'm like, zombie snakes? <laughs> that sounds like something come out of Hollywood. <laughs> I, uh, I would not pay any money to see that movie. Okay? 
That's the enemy. Is the snake that's been defeated and in its death throes is striking out at everything that it can. All right? And if you're not prepared, you can be overwhelmed. You can be knocked off your feet. You can be derailed in your faith. Not unsaved, derailed in your faith. Okay? And he will do everything possible to put you in a place where you are ineffective. Okay? So, he's defeated at Calvary. His eternity is fixed, and I believe it is imminent. Revelation 20.10, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We are very close to this. Okay? We have to live our lives as thus, though this were going to happen right now. You know why? Because when this happens, the way to eternity with God is shut. It is closed. And all of those who have not made it inside will be completely severed from him for all of eternity. This is why it is so important that the Great Commission is the Great Commission and not the so-so commission. Not the mediocre commission. Not the if you have time or inclination commission. Okay? God has called us to go and preach the gospel. To make disciples. Okay? There's no, no none of this drive-by gospel shooting. Jesus loves you! I'll take a Big Mac, a large fry, and a, oh yeah, supersize me. I know. I got a tract, I got a dollar. There you go, keep the change. I score. Mm. Man, I just witnessed to them. All right, I'm not saying don't hand out tracks. Hand out tracks. First, live your life in such a way that when you open your mouth, people are going to believe what you say and believe that you believe what you're going to say. All right? And if you're not living your life in a godly manner, please shut up about God. Okay? Yeah, man, speak of the grace of God. But man, if you're out there cussing with your buddies and ogling the women or gossiping with the women at your, your sewing circle or... or um, soap opera fest or what I don't know what do women do during the day I don't know <laughs> Christy's so busy taking care of me that I, she has no life <laughs> but live your life in such a way that when you preach the gospel they know you believe it they know and as St. Augustine said preach always preach always Always, if necessary, use words. I, I really don't like that because a lot of times we cop out. You know, we're like, I said, hello to the cashier. <laughs> See how godly I am? I was courteous. <laughs> oh. Know your enemy. He hates you. He wants to steal everything from you that he can. I don't think it's about stuff. Quite honestly, I think he wants to give you more stuff because stuff tends to distract you from God. So don't go, oh, oh, I lost my car. The devil took my car. Do you need a car? No, you need transportation. Okay? You need a way to get from point A to point B. And if you're in Houston, it has to have air conditioning. <laughs> because it's really hard to pedal your bike fast enough that the air actually feels cool. But you need transportation. Okay? So when he's trying to steal stuff from you, what is he trying? He's trying to steal your joy, your peace, your love. All the fruit that God is birthing in you to come out of you, he wants to take that all away. 
He wants you stressed and anxious because that is not faith in God. He wants you questioning, where is God in this? What is God doing? What's his plan? I don't think he's going to pull through. He's not, he's not going to come through on this one. He wants to kill you. Man, if you're affected for God, he wants you dead. He'd rather have you in eternity with God than making converts and disciples here on earth. And he wants to destroy you. I believe that. Why is that markedly different than kill you? You think kill is bad enough? I think he wants to destroy you so that your testimony is invalid. He wants to shake up your faith so bad that you have nothing to say to anybody. You go, well, God is sovereign. Why does he let this happen? Why? To grow you. Because God wants you dependent on him. Not stuff, not things, not people. Not people. I mean, man, when things go on in our lives, we might pray about it, we might toss it up to God, but who do we go to? We go to our friends that are going to console us, commiserate with us, pat us on the back, encourage us. We don't go to those friends that go, yeah, you screwed up. You probably, probably shouldn't have done that. You need to put some measures in place so you don't do that again. Sorry, guys, I'm one of those people. My wife is, is an encourager par excellence, all right? She is the only one in our family. <laughs> All the rest of us are exhorters. And boy, when you're an encourager and everybody else in your family's an exhorter, life is rough. <laughs> life is rough. Because instead of coming up and putting our arm around her, and sweetheart, it's going to be okay. It's all right. We're like, wow, you really blew that one, didn't you? <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, if you'd done this, that probably wouldn't have happened. <laughs> Pieces go flying everywhere. Okay? I believe he wants to completely destroy everything that God wants to do in your life. Okay? So know your enemy. Yeah, he's got a lot going for him. He's a deceiver. He's an accuser. He comes as the angel of light. He comes like a roaring lion. But he is not greater than our God. He is subject and bound to the will of our Heavenly Father. So there is nothing, absolutely nothing, he can do to you outside of God's permission. And if God's given him permission, it's because God trusts you to throw yourself on him so he can prove himself to you. And it may take a while... But man, you have got to keep, get in there and keep pressing in. Keep pressing in. Keep pressing in. God's not showing up yet? Keep pressing in. He's not giving you an answer yet? Keep pressing in. Keep pressing in. Don't give up until God has done what he says he will do. He will deliver you. Don't give up. Stand firm. Firmly planted. Rooted and grounded. Unshaken. Unmovable. Because your foundation is Jesus Christ. And that solid rock can't be moved. Amen? Amen? Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, that our enemy is out there, but, Father, he's not in here. There is nothing, Father, that he can do to me that you will not allow, that you will not help me to overcome. I ask, Lord God, that as we examine our lives, we look into the areas of our lives where we have failed, Father, that we would trust you, we would turn these over to you, we would press into you to overcome these things, Father, that our testimony would be complete, that our faith would lack nothing. I ask, God, that you would help us to be encouragers as well as exhorters, to come alongside our brothers and sisters, to encourage them in this race and father if necessary to exhort them and even if if, if would uh, be needed father to rebuke or chastise but father always to spur one another on always to press in further to you 
I bless you, Father, that none of these things is even possible <clears throat> except for your spirit that lives in us. None of these things are even possible except for your son who has paid the price. And none of these things are even possible except for your love that motivated all of these things to work. We bless you, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.